Alright, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulihi al Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. If I recall correctly, this is the, the fourth of uh, our series on the life of Imam Ahmad. Rahimahullah. Now, if you remember, last time we spoke about the creation, this idea that the Quran is not the speech of Allah, that it's the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was started first by a man by the name of Al Ja'd ibn Durhum, who was caught and executed by the state. Then a man by the name of Al Jahm ibn Safwan, the one that Al Jahmiyyah were named after, continued with, this, with similar thoughts like that. And then Bishr ibn Ghiyath, the one that is famously known as Bishr al Marisi. He was, um, he continued with these same ideas, spreading them around. And then Harun al-Rashid, when he got, when he heard of what he was saying, he basically was going to execute him as well. So Bishr al-Marisi went into hiding and he remained in hiding until Harun al-Rashid died. And then he emerged again during the reign of al-Ma'mun, who, as we said, al-Ma'mun used to surround himself with those kinds of people and gave them positions in his government. So he, was, he had a lot of influence on the, the Khalifa and those around him. Just a little bit about Al-Ma'mun himself before we continue. He's, his name was, or his nickname, Abu Al-Abbas, so father of Al-Abbas. His name was Abdullah actually, Abdullah ibn Harun al-Rashid. Now, he's known by his, what is known as a regnal name. A regnal name is like a, like a title name, like how in our days, most famously, I guess, the Pope, who would have his own name, but he'll choose a regnal name. So the Abbas al Khulafa, they had their name, but then he would call himself Al Wathiq, Al Mutawakkil, and in this case, Al Ma'mun, even though his name was Abdullah, as we said. And he was the seventh Khalifa uh, from the Abbasid dynasty. Imam al Tabari, rahimahullah, he gives a description of the physical description of Al Ma'mun. He said he was of average height, he was light skinned, he had a light complexion, and he was handsome, and he had a long beard that later on started to lose its dark color as he aged. And he mentions also that this Khalifa was eloquent. He was able to speak concisely and eloquently without preparation. And he was very generous, had a lot of respect for the Prophet ﷺ, a lot of respect for the religion, and he loved justice and, and poetry and so on and so forth. Now, all these things don't prevent him going astray. Like in the fact that he went astray in the issue of the creation of the Quran, and then he started going overboard with when punishing people and threatening people. This can all happen while he has love of poetry and respect for the Prophet Wasallam and so on and so forth. Uh, Ibn Abd Rabbi, who wrote a book, uh, the book Al-Iqd Al-Farid, with the unique necklace, he also gives another description of Al-Ma'mun, also saying his light complexion, and then he mentions he has slightly blonde hair, a long thin beard, and a narrow forehead. And Al-Ma'mun had one wife that she was the daughter of his uncle. He married her when he was 18 years old, and he got two sons from her, Muhammad Al-Asghar and Abdullah. And then he had many other concubines, and he, would, he got children from the other concubines. One of them, specifically her name was Sundus, he got five children just from her. But, uh, and here's an interesting fact, by the way. There is, uh, you know, on the moon, our moon, you'll see these uh, holes, like these circles. These circles are impact craters. So an asteroid or something would come and it would hit against the surface of the moon and leave a crater. There is, in the, what they call the south central region of the moon, there is an impact crater that is named al maymun or Al-Mamun, which يعني, basically they admit that they named it after the Khalifa Al-Ma'mun. What led to that? I have no idea, but there is a crater on the moon, on the south central region of the moon called Al-Ma'mun uh, crater. So, if you want to look that up. Anyways, we mentioned that he delayed coming out with his crazy or his strange thoughts on the creation of the Quran because of men like Yazid ibn Harun, you know, the serious well, the, the scholar that had a, a high rank, the one that used to have a, a sense of humor, like to joke, but because of men like him, he delayed coming out out of fear that they might um, 
what's the word, uh, like basically oppose him. Now, just a recap on why it is problematic to say that the Quran is created. Number one, they began by denying attributes of Allah Azza wa such as hearing, speaking, seeing. So speaking is one of them. So they said Allah can't hear because, astaghfirullah, because then he would have ears like us, even though that makes no sense whatsoever. And if I just, in the animal kingdom, I tell you whales can hear and we can hear. Do you imagine that whales hear in the same way we hear? That's one. Two, do you imagine whales will have human ears on them, Mathana? Or if I tell you the wolf can hear, do you imagine a wolf with human ears on its head? Or do you imagine humans with wolf ears? It's just each one hears in a way that befits them. So they denied Allah's attributes of speaking and seeing and hearing because then because they said Allah has no eyes, no ears, and uh, that he's not able to hear. You know something interesting? In the hadith of the Dajjal, this is a little unrelated, okay? But the Prophet Sallallahu he, in more than one hadith, he wants us to realize how to easily tell if the Dajjal, I mean, that the Dajjal is the Dajjal. He says, if any of you gets confused, remember this. And your Lord is not one-eyed, meaning has a defect in one eye. And what's interesting about that, if it were as the Mu'tazila were saying that Allah has no eyes to see with, wouldn't the Prophet say then instead, instead of, and your Lord is not one-eyed, he would say your Lord has no eyes, مثلاً? that's just something to think about there. So that was the first issue. They, have, they denied attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we said everything that is created is imperfect, has flaws, and has room for improvement. When you say the Quran is created, that means it's imperfect, it has flaws, and there's room for improvement. Number three, everything that is created has an end. And um, it's, not a, it's, it's not like the most powerful one, but it comes in handy, you'll see later on in this story as we continue. And then the fourth, which is also very, very important. And that is, no one before has ever come with this. Yani, from the time of the rightly guided Khulafa, from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, from the amazing and magnificent Tabi'een, none of them ever said that. From Atba'a Tabi'een, no one ever said that. And then suddenly, 200 years later or so, you come up with this, like you're the only one who discovered that, you're the only one who realized this truth, and all these thousands of righteous people who lived before you did not know it, the companions didn't know it, the Prophet ﷺ didn't speak of it, that should tell you there is a problem. And you can use this technique with, with anything, especially today with all the crazy things. Someone will come and, like, this is a true story. We were in one of the states here, I'm not gonna mention which one, in America, and a guy came to me, he tells me, I, and I'd see him every time I would come to that city, that community, I would see him and he would always come with weird things. Very Mu'tazili type thoughts. So then he came to me, he said, I wrote a book about Adam alayhi salam, and inshallah it's gonna be printed soon. I said, oh, that's great. He said, it has a lot of very new ideas. I said, I like new. He said, Adam had a father. I said, you lost me, Mushbas, you lost me. Yeah, and he, I was like, I'm not interested at this point. He's like, yes, Adam had a father and... Uh, you know, you get to the point where someone says something so ridiculous, I don't even want to know your dalil, your evidence. Because most likely your evidence is probably dumber than what you just said. That's how it works. Anyways, <laughs> as we continue the story, two names you need to remember. Number one, Ahmad ibn Abi Duad. This is that minister, the right-hand man of the Khalifa, very deviant man. And he's the one who keeps rekindling the fitna and he keeps whispering in the ear of the Khalifa, you know, to get him riled up against people. The other name you need to remember is Haq ibn Ibrahim. We said he is the, the chief of police and during the absence, or, or like the deputy of the city, and in the absence of the Khalifa, he is the governor of Iraq or of Baghdad. So Al Ma'moon, this is kind of where we left off last time, Al Ma'moon wrote many letters to Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. And by the way, all these letters that he sent him, they're all preserved in the history books. And he asks him now to start testing people on their positions regarding the creation of the Qur'an. 
The first group, the group that agreed, that was a large number. The majority of people said, okay. Yeah, they, they didn't show any kind of resistance to this idea. Um, then we have a second group that adamantly said no. These are the three categories. The largest one, those who said okay. The second group, small group, those who adamantly refused and said no. And then the third group would be those who didn't say yes or no, they're showing willingness to, to say that or to, to concede to that or to uh, consent to that. An example from the second group, this man, Abil Hassan or Abi Hassan Aziadi. So he comes, now this is uh, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, and he's asking people, he's testing and questioning them. So he comes in front of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, who tells him, Ma indak. He said, what do you have? He said, Sal amma shit. He said, ask whatever you like. So then he reads to him from this paper that says, I bear witness that there is no God, God worthy of worship except Allah, Ahadun, Fardun. Nothing was before him and nothing is after him and doesn't resemble his creation in any meaning or any way. So it looks good, but there is a hidden meaning in it when he's saying he doesn't resemble his creation in any meaning or in any way or his realistically they're saying his creation doesn't resemble him either right so that's going back to their simple problem if we can hear then it can't be that Allah can hear because nothing is like him and remember the verse they never continue it because Laysa and he's the all hearing all seeing so then he asks him Al Quran huwa? The Quran, is it created? So here, Abu Hassan, he says, Al Quran, Kalamullah. Wallahu khaliqu kulli shay. He says, The Quran is the speech of Allah, and Allah is the creator of everything. Wama dun Allah, makhluq. And anything besides Allah is created. So it's like, you know, you know maneuvering around uh, the direct question here. He's saying, and everything besides Allah is created. And Amir al Mu'minin is our leader. He hears what we don't and he knows what we don't. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in charge of our affairs. So he establishes our hajj and our prayers. And we pay him our zakah. And we make jihad with him. And we see his imama as legitimate. Like his leadership is legitimate. And we do, we do what he commands. And we stay away from what he forbids. And, he calls, and if he calls us to something, we comply. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim says, Al-Quran, makhluqun huwa. He says, the Quran, is it created or not? So then he gives the same long reply. So then he took out the letter that Al-Ma'moon sent him. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, and he mentions what's in the letter. So then uh, our scholar here, Abu Hassan, he says, that could be his opinion. But he shouldn't force people upon it, nor coerce them. But if you tell me that Amir al-Mu'mineen commands us to say so, then I will. So he's saying, if Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying we have to say it, then I'll say it. But is, he shouldn't force people upon his opinion. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, and remember this is in the beginning time yet, he wasn't, forced, he wasn't forcing people to accept it. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim says, he didn't command me to force anyone upon it. And he just told me to see where everyone stands. Then it was Imam Ahmad rahimahullah's turn, and he asked, he told him, ما تقول في القرآن? What do you say concerning the Quran? Imam Ahmad rahimahullah is not gonna go, you know, beat about the bushes, they say. He said, he tells him, هو كلام الله. He said, أما خلوق هو? Is it created? He said, هو كلام الله. It's the creation, it's the speech of Allah. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim tells him, in this letter I read to you, Allah, and he quotes the Khalifa saying, Allah does not resemble his creation. في وجه من الوجوه ولا معنى من المعاني. What do you say about that? We said, remember we said in, in any way, shape or form or in any, in any meaning, Allah does not resemble his creation. So Imam Ahmad responded, ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير. There is nothing like him and he is the all hearing. All seeing. So someone from the audience who's watching this, he asked permission from Ishaq ibn Ibrahim to speak. And he granted him permission. 
So then he got up and he said, now he basically this is just a person who wants to incite Ishaq ibn Ibrahim against Imam Ahmad, dislikes Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. So he's explaining what's going on. He gets up and he says, he, meaning Imam Ahmad says, that Allah is all hearing from an ear and basir with an eye, seeing, all seeing with an eye. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim said, what is the meaning of Samir and Basir? And Imam Ahmad answered, he is as he described himself. He said, what is the meaning? He said, we don't know, he is as he described himself. Yani he means, how does he hear? That's what he means. What is his hearing, all hearing, all seeing? How does he hear? How does he see? And yani Imam Ahmad, and no other scholar, has the details to tell you yani what part or what or how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears. He says, he is as he described himself. He said, what is the meaning? He says, we don't know, but he is as he described himself. Yani, it's the easiest answer, really. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is the all hearing, he is the all hearing. That's how he described himself. If he says he sees everything, then he is as he described himself. It's not your business and it's not my job because I believe this to explain to you the mechanism. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't describe that to anybody. So he said he is as he described himself. So then, uh, so we're saying now. This Imam Ahmad now being in that group that completely refused, very clearly and did not beat about the bush or anything. There's um, others that were flexible. This is a scholar, his name was Ibn al-Bakka al-Akbar. He said, they asked him, is the Quran created? He said, al-Quran maj'ool. Because Allah says in the Quran, inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan arabiya. The Quran is maj'ool. Maj'ool. Uh, made, صح? made is like uh, he said the Quran was made because Allah said we made it in Arabic Quran. So and he said well Quran muhdath because Allah subhanahu wa taala says ما يأتيهم من ذكر من ربهم محدث. There is not a ذكر that comes to them from their Lord muhdath, which the translators say recent revelation, but something is muhdath is also new or recent. So then Ishaq ibn Ibrahim doesn't want all these games. He said, isn't what is maj'ool, makhluq, isn't anything made, created? So Ibn al-Bakka, he said, yes. He said, then it's makhluq, then it's created, then the Quran is created. If it's made and everything that's made is created, then the Quran is created. He says, no, I won't say makhluq, but I'll say maj'ool. So, he doesn't want a direct head-on confrontation with the Khalifa and his government, but he also doesn't want to use their same terms. So he found some, you know, something else. So now Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, then he wrote a report to Al-Ma'moon with all the responses of all the scholars, like a detailed report of what everybody said. Um, a man by the name of Al-Fadl ibn Ziyad, he said, I heard Ahmed ibn Hanbal on the first day that Ishaq tried him, meaning tested him. And after he left, meaning, so after it was over, and that day was in Jumada al-Akhirah of the year 2018. He sat at his place of prayer, Imam Ahmad sat at his regular place of prayer, and a group of people asked him who had consented. Like the public wants to know which scholar said okay, and which ones refused. And it was a, as if this was a severe burden upon him. It was very hard for him to to say who is, meaning, you know, it's such a painful thing to say this great scholar or this great person or this righteous man agreed to what they were saying. But, uh, so he said, not one of our companions consented and all praises for Allah. Then he mentioned those who consented, those who agreed and said the Quran is created, and those who agreed to most of what they wanted, and those who said it is something done and something new. He tried... Uh, um, yeah, he says he tried them once. Yani he would test them all once and he would test me twice. Remember, this is after Imam Ahmad started teaching at age 40 and he has his incredible popularity and is well known and he has this huge halaq of a lot of students. So he's given special treatment. He tested him twice. He said to me, what do you say about the Quran? And this is the same discussion we just went through. But he's just giving it himself here. He says, what do you say about the Qur'an? So I said, the speech of Allah, not created. 
So he made me sit at the side and then questioned the others. Then he brought me forward again and questioned me again and sought to use text whose meanings were not directly manifest. So I said, Laysa kamithlihi shay. He gives them a number of verses from the Quran. So Imam Ahmad tells him, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Nothing is like him, nothing is comparable to him. This is the same incident, but from the, from the eyes of, through the eyes of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah himself. So we said, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim sends this letter back to Al Ma'moon, detailed, detailing all the answers, the responses from the scholars. Nine days later, he receives a letter back from Al Ma'moon, and Ishaq gathered everyone again. And he read the letter of Al Ma'moon which is preserved in its entirety. But to, to sum up what was in it, he begins by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He says, I have received your response to my letter. So my first letter, you wrote back a response to it. And then he starts to insult the scholars and accuse them of hypocrisy and theft and of loving the dunya. And he insults them by name, but he's insulting the, the big shots who did not agree with him by name. As for so-and-so, send him to me. And let him make toba, and if he and let him make his toba publicly, and if he refuses, strike his neck. Then he'll go to the next person, Ahmed ibn Yazid. He says, "This is one of the scholars at the time." He said, "Ahmed ibn Yazid. He is a he is mentally a child. I consider him a child in his head. He's mentally not mature, and because he refused to answer the question, he says he can't answer the question, but he will answer when he's beaten. After I beat him, he'll be able to answer, and if he doesn't." If that doesn't work, then the sword. So he's threatening their lives too. As for Ahmad ibn Hanbal, then he doesn't insult him. So he doesn't say anything bad about him. But he doesn't, well, he does say something. He said, but I know what he means. Yani I understand his answer. I understand the message he's sending me. And I'm now aware of his ignorance. So he called him ignorant. So I guess in, by comparison, he got off easy. Yani. As for Al-Fadl ibn Ghanim, I know what he did in Egypt, and the wealth he gathered in less than a year. You see what he's hinting at. He's saying Al-Fadl ibn Ghanim, he stole money in Egypt. That's how he became so rich in one year. How did he become so rich in a year? And then he says, whoever does not renounce his shirk. So he's calling it shirk to call the Quran the speech of Allah. Send them to my camp, in Mu'askar, because remember, he was out of the city now, in, out of Baghdad. He was in Tastur, actually, which is... Uh, Yani Tastur is, uh, is, in, um, is in Turkey, if I'm not mistaken. Tastur, huh? Anyways, he says, if they don't recant, they will get the sword. This was 2018 after the Hijrah. So they gathered all the scholars, and this letter was read to them with all its threats and insults. And they were told, you either agree or you will, you will get killed. And this fitna spread to all corners of the ummah. All kinds of scholars were questioned. And those who refused were sent to Baghdad. Even if they were far, they were sent to Baghdad. And prisons then became filled with scholars. And so they started one by one to break and to agree. Yes, the Quran is created. Just get us out of here. Imam Ahmad was very hard against the scholars who gave in. And he used to issue fatwa, uh, fatawa, those who give in and say that the Qur'an is created, a hadith should not be taken from them. You should not narrate a hadith from them. And no one should sit, meaning to learn from them. Nor any fatwa should be written from him. And if he dies, the top scholars should not attend his funeral prayer. As a message. Because he's not saying nobody should attend their funeral prayer. They're still Muslim. But the top scholars should not go. Because it's a message and it's showing disapproval of what they did. This, uh, and from the people in that group who consented, there were two who were his friends and his companions. One of them by the name of Abu Nasr at tamar And the famous Yahya ibn Ma'in. They were from that group. One day, Yahya ibn Ma'in visited Imam Ahmad. This was later on. And so, so the family let him in, and he came into the room where Imam Ahmad is on his bed, and he is ill. So when Yahya ibn Ma'in entered, Imam Ahmad turned away from him and refused to speak to him the entire time. Another, by the name, was, by the name of Al-Huzami, he visited Imam Ahmad. He, he wasn't sick at this point. Imam Ahmad opened the door. When he saw it was him, 
he slammed the door in his face, completely refused to speak to them. An example of the scholars who stood firm was a great scholar by the name of Nu'aym ibn Hammad. He was a scholar and a muhaddith, and he, he was known for having this position of responding to the mubtadi'a, to the heretics. He would write volumes of books refuting them, and he was living in Egypt at the time. And he was a great scholar who studied with the likes of Hushayim ibn Bashir. And I'm sure everybody remembers Hushayim ibn Bashir. Remember, his father was the cook. And the judge came to his house and his father started to support his knowledge from that day on. So uh, Imam Ahmad mentioned something about Nu'aym ibn Hamad. He says, he came as we were at the doors of Hushayim. Meaning, when he came to us, we were studying with Hushayim. And uh, yeah. So, and he said, why don't you categorize the hadith? And he's like, you, we used to just write the hadith and write the next one right under it and the next one right under it. And it was from this scholar, Nu'aym ibn Hamad, rahimahullah, that they got this idea of let's start to categorize the hadith instead of just making one long list of all different subject matters. And also to show you how, how much of a heavy, heavy hitter Nu'aym ibn Hamad was, he studied with Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. Those who narrate from him, Yahya ibn Ma'in narrates from him, Imam Bukhari narrates from him, and Nisa'i narrates from him. This great scholar was taken all the way from Egypt to Iraq because he refused to agree and to say that the Quran is created. And so he was imprisoned in Samirra, the city of Samirra in Iraq, and he died there in his chains. But what a waste. Dying over what? It was just refusing to agree with this thing that the Ummah has never heard of before. This is Salih, the son of Imam Ahmad. He says, Then the people were put to trial, and those who refused to consent were threatened with imprisonment. So all of them consented except for four. We said last time, if everybody stands firm and everybody says no, then that weight and that pressure will be distributed amongst a lot of shoulders. But if just four people remain, then they bear all that pressure. He says, all of them consented except for four. My father, Muhammad ibn Nuh, and Al-Qawariri, and Al-Hasan ibn Hamad, or Al-Hasan ibn Hamad. He says, then these last two consented. So the last two also gave in, and so my father and Muhammad ibn Nuh remained in prison for some days. Then the order came from al Ma'moon that they were to be brought in chains together. So send them all the way to al Ma'moon. Uh, Muhammad ibn Nuh, a little bit about him. So it's just Imam Ahmad now and this young man. His name is Muhammad ibn Nuh. He was a young man from the students of knowledge and from the top students of Imam Ahmad himself. Salih, the son of Imam Ahmad, says, My father and Muhammad ibn Nuh were taken from Baghdad in chains. So we went out with them to Al-Ambar, uh, to, to this area. Then Abu Bakr al-Ahwal, who was with me, asked my father, Ya Aba Abdullah, if they threaten you with the sword, will you consent? So this man who is with Salih, the son of Imam Ahmad, and they're just going along with this group. They're being sent all the way to the Khalifa. But uh, I said Tastur earlier. It's, it's Tarsus, right? Tarsus. And Tarsus in English. Anyways, um, so he says, we were going with them. And then this man, Abu Bakr al-Ahwal, he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, if they threaten you with the sword, will you consent? If they're going to kill you, will you say yes? And Imam Ahmad answered, no. And I'm not going to agree, even if they're going to kill me. Then they were taken. This is Salih, the son of the Imam, saying, Then they were taken. And I heard my father say, We came to, this is later on, he's now narrating from his father later on. He said, We came to Ar Rahba, uh, and we left there in the middle of the night. And a man came up to us and said, So a man from the, from the Bedouins, of, from Rabi'a, ah, came and asked, which of you is Ahmad ibn Hanbal? So this procession, this group of people, he comes to them, he says, which of you is Ahmad ibn Hanbal? So people pointed and said, this one. So he came to me. This is Imam Ahmad now narrating himself, and his son is telling us the narration. 
So he, he said, so he greeted my father. Then he said, oh, you, you are the representative of the people. So do not let them down. And you're the head of the people today. So don't, so don't ever let people down by consenting to what they're calling you. So the people will then consent. Yeah, and if you say yes, then the people will say yes. They look at you as a leader and people follow you. So if you say yes, they'll say yes. He says, so don't ever let people down by consenting to what they're calling you to, so that the people will then consent. And then you will carry the sins of all on the day of judgment. And if you love Allah, then be patient upon what you're on. For there is not between you and Al-Jannah except that you're killed. And if you're not killed, you'll die. Yani he's telling him, if, you, if you're not killed during this incident with this mihna, you're going to die at some point. Yani you still die. So it's like choosing which death do you want. Do you want an honorable death? And you're escaping from an honorable death. And then you'll just die in your bed. You can die in your bed or you can die defending the religion. So he's telling him, if you're not going to be killed, you're still going to die. So, uh, really powerful. So he tells him, oh you, what if you're killed right here and enter Jannah right here? Wassalam. And he left. Just like that. And came, just gave this advice and just disappeared into the night. So Imam Ahmad said, who was that? And they told him he's a man from the A'rab, from the Bedouins, from Rabi'ah, who recites poetry and he's, he is called Jabir ibn Amir. Imam Ahmad says his speech was from that which strengthened my resolve to, st to stay steadfast in refusing what they were calling me to. He also mentions this, uh, his reaction to, to what this man said to him in uh, another narration here. Where is it? He says that, uh, this is Ibrahim ibn Abdullah, he said, Imam Ahmad said, I did not hear a word since I fell into this affair, meaning this test, stronger than the saying of the Bedouin who spoke to me at Rahbat Tawq. This is the, the same incident. He said, nothing was as strong and strengthened my resolve as a statement of this person. I don't know him, but he said this and it kept me strong, kept me going. So, um, and there were other people as well who came to advise him. This was not just the only piece of advice or words of encouragement. This is Abbas al-Duri. He said, I heard Ja'far al-Ambari say, I crossed the Euphrates to meet Ahmed. So I went just specifically to meet Imam Ahmed. And actually when Imam Ahmed saw him, he tells him that like, at nafsak, like you basically burdened yourself, you know, coming all the way to see me. Still a good friend, still, still well-mannered. So this man, uh, Ja'far al-Ambari, he says, I said to him, today you are a head whom the people follow. Yeah, and you are a leader that people follow. So wallahi, if you consent to the saying that the Quran is created, then the rest of the people will consent to it. But if you refuse, then many people will refuse. So even if the man, meaning the al-Ma'moon, doesn't kill you, you will still die. Very similar to the Bedouin, right? He says, even if the man doesn't kill you, you will still die, and death is certain. So fear Allah and do not consent. So Imam Ahmad, when he received this advice, he began to weep. And he said, Ma sha Allah, whatever Allah wills. Then he said, Ya Aba Ja'far, repeat it to me. He, he loved it. He wanted to hear it again. He says, so I repeated it. And he, he was saying, he kept saying, Ma sha Allah, yani whatever Allah wills. So when they came close to the army of the Khalifa, remember now it's Muhammad ibn Nuh and Imam Ahmad rahimahumullah, and they're with the soldiers and, and all these people that are being sent to the Khalifa. And they've been traveling for a while now. When they came close to the army of the Khalifa, close to the camp, they came to the last resting place, the rest, rest stop before they reached the Khalifa. A servant of al Ma'moon came to them. So Imam Ahmad was praying at night and, and was praying Fajr or prayed Fajr. And Imam Ahmad narrates it. This, this servant of Al-Ma'moon, he says, he entered upon me while he was wiping away his tears with the edge of his garment. So he comes in and he's just crying and wiping his tears away. And he says, saying, it is difficult for me, Ya Aba Abdullah, 
Indeed, Al Ma'moon has unsheathed, taken out a sword that he has not unsheathed before that. And he swears by his blood relation to the Prophet وسلم, that if you don't respond to saying that the Quran is created, that he will kill you with that sword. On that, Imam Ahmad got up and he prayed and then he lifted his hands in dua and he said, Sayyidi, my master, غَرَّ حِلْمُكَ هَذَا الْفَاجِرِ He says, your patience and forbearance has deceived this transgressor to the point that he resorted to beating and to killing. O oh Allah, if the Qur'an is your speech and uncreated, then protect us from him. And no sooner had he finished prayer and no sooner had he finished making this dua and his hands are coming down, he starts to hear people yelling and commotion and loud voices. And then the news comes to them of the death of Al Ma'moon. Al Ma'moon died that, that same morning. Or maybe he died at night and the news reached him in the morning, but the point is he made that dua and he asked to be protected from him. And other, others mentioned that he asked to never see him, to never meet Al Ma'moon. And even though he got to the final resting position or resting post before they, they get to him, he never got to see him. His answer, his dua was answered. Um, I just wanted to mention, for what it's worth, Imam Al Tabari, rahimahullah, he mentions the incident of how Al Ma'moon died. Like he didn't just die in his sleep, there was something that happened before. So he mentions how Al Ma'moon was sitting on the riverbank telling those around him how splendid and wonderful the water was. So, uh, and he, they were dangling their feet in the water like that. So he asked what would go best with this water. So it was nice, cold, clear water. And you know, back then they drank that water. They didn't have, you know, there was nothing wrong with drinking right out, out of a river. It's something we would never do today, right? So uh, he asked them what, what food would go best with this nice, cold, clear water. And they told him about a specific kind of fresh dates. And then he noticed that a sup the supplies were arriving or supply caravan was arriving. So he asked someone to check if those dates that they mentioned was included with the supplies that were arriving. And they were. So he invited those who are with him to enjoy the water with these dates. And then Imam al tabari mentions all those who did so fell ill. Everybody who ate those dates and drank that water got sick, but others recovered, but Al Ma'moon died. And, and as you know, his story where he encouraged his half-brother who took over after him. So it wasn't his son, Abdullah, that took over, but he encouraged him to you know, keep Abu, Ibn Abi Du'ad as his minister and, and all that stuff that we mentioned last time. A anyways, uh, going back to, to where we were, right? So. What to do with them now? Yani, the Khalifa, who wanted to see them, died. So what are we going to do with these, with these two men in their chains? So they sent them back to prison, going back to Baghdad now. Until the new Khalifa decides what to do with them. Dal al Mu'tasim, the new Khalifa. So the two men now with the guards and with this, you know, with this procession and with their chains are now being sent back again. But on the way, the young man, Muhammad ibn Nuh, he falls ill. Salih said, and every time I say Salih said, or Salih narrates, it means Salih, the son of Imam Ahmad. He said, so when my father and Muhammad ibn Nuh came to Tarsus, or Tarsus, they, went, they were sent back to Al-Raqqa and were placed on a boat. So then when they reached Al-Anat, Muhammad ibn Nuh died and his chains were removed, his chains were removed, and my father prayed over him. Imam Ahmad himself, a quote from him, he says, I did not see anyone along with his age and knowledge who was better and stood more firm for Allah's sake than Muhammad ibn Nuh. And I hope that his actions were sealed with good. Yani his end was that which was good. One day he said to me, so Imam Ahmad is telling what Muhammad ibn Nuh said to him. He tells him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Allah, Allah, you are not the same as me. You are a man 
who is followed. You have a following. So Muhammad ibn Nuh, the scholar, said even though he was knowledgeable, but he was young, he didn't have a, a following, he didn't have students under him. He himself was a student of knowledge. So he says, you are not the same as I. You are a man who is followed. The people stretch their necks towards you. Yani, when you're listening attentively, you put your neck out like this. So it's being descriptive. He said, the people stretch their necks towards you to see what you'll do. So fear Allah and be firm for, for Allah's sake. And then he died and I prayed over him and buried him. So now it's just, and it's just very, really, it's really heartbreaking. The death of Muhammad ibn Nuh is something that is just, um, I just find it very, very heartbreaking. This young man, you know, who was a great student of knowledge, who memorized and learned so much, and he was good in adab and akhlaq. And then he dies in an unmarked grave. Nobody knows where he, is, he was buried today. Qadr Allah, he didn't have enough time to, to write or maybe get married and have children. He dies over this issue. يعني, the issue itself, he dies for the sake of Allah. That's the great part and that's the mercy of Allah upon him. And the sad part is you know, it's not a worthy, meaning the whole trial of is the Quran, the speech of Allah or not. Just nonsense that these people started. And then they're forcing people upon it and filling the prisons with scholars and muhaddithin. Over what? So it's, he dies in his chains with no mercy given with all these soldiers traveling. He's ill and they're still traveling. And so Imam Ahmad prays over him and buries him. And then he now is alone, continuing in this strange land with the soldiers and the people of uh, the Khalifa on their way back to Baghdad. And he would say, prison is hated and chains are hated and the beating is hated to me and the threats and threatening is hated to me. But for the sake of Allah, it is all easy. So, he, Salih says, my father was taken to Baghdad in chains and remained a few days in Yasiriya. And he was imprisoned in the house of Umara in the stable of the Amir, Muhammad ibn Ishaq. Muhammad ibn Ishaq, he's the brother of uh, uh, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. Afwan, yeah, Afwan. Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, his name. This is the brother of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. Then he was moved to general prison in Mausoliya Street. And so now, can you imagine the great Imam with his knowledge, this great scholar is in prison, the general prison, with criminals and thieves and crooks. Not really a place for a scholar, but he's in prison with them. He said, Imam Ahmad said, I used to lead the prisoners uh, in prayer while, and I was chained. So in, in his heavy chains, he's still leading them in prayer. Then in Ramadan 2019, his son says, uh, 14 months after the death of Al-Ma'mun. 14 months. So you would imagine that, okay, Al-Ma'mun wanted them. So okay, after he dies, let them go. And if the next Khalifa wants them, we'll go and arrest them again. But they kept him in jail for 14 months. Then he says, I was moved to the house of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. In Ramadan 2019, I was moved to the house of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. Another man, or, or Hanbal said, he was imprisoned in a stable in Baghdad. And we already mentioned that. He was severely restricted in his imprisonment and fell ill in Ramadan. Then he was moved to the general prison. So just the same from a different narrator. And he remained in prison for about 30 months. Can you imagine that? Over what? For 30 months he's in prison. And the next Khalifa is still busy with the, you know, tending to the affairs of the state and hasn't even freed up to, to look at them. But they can just sit there in jail until he's ready to look at them. But this man says, we used to come to him and read the book, and, and, and he read the book, Al-Irja, to me, and other books while he was in prison, and I saw him lead the prisoners in his chains. He would take his foot out of the main monocle at times of prayer and at times of sleep. Well, now that Al-Ma'mun is, is passed on, we have the next Khalifa, we said his half-brother, Al-Mu'tasim, takes over. What does he do? Unfortunately, it does not get easier. We get more imprisonment and whipping and beatings. Uh, it becomes a far more dramatic, but inshallah, we'll continue it next Tuesday, inshallah, same time, bi'idhnillah. Don't forget, tomorrow we're doing the signs of the hour at the same time, 8.15, inshallah. Zakum al-khairan for...
tuning in and for listening. Sallallahu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.